All right, another Q&A. If you want to ask me a question, then make sure you follow me on Instagram at Seamland, where I do those Q&As there regularly. The first question is, which supplement do you swear by? <laughs> well, I don't swear by about like any supplements. Uh, obviously, I'm not going to mention glycine right now because many people will just comment, hey, you're just talking about glycine again. <laughs> I'm also not going to, let's say, I'm going to give you like two categories or let's say a few examples of some supplements that I like swear by in some sense and based on like the research then obviously the, the one supplement that I do think that uh, is you know definitely proven to have a lot of health benefits and uh, you know proven to be like an actual longevity supplement then uh, based on the current like let's say clinical trials I would say it's a uh, glynac so glycine and NAC I'm not going to go into like full details about the reason so like you know it's going to be mostly because it has been shown to reverse hallmarks of aging in humans and improve like other functional outcomes and uh, it uh, also like you know targets one specific you know problem that goes wrong with aging which is the increased oxidative stress and inflammation because of decreased glutathione but the issue is that uh, the glynac supplementation probably works only in like the older people so you know something like 60s 70s 80s is some is is the age where i would pretty much take glynac every day and you see that after 45 you will see that uh, glutathione levels uh, start to decrease so I don't see a real you know reason why you would like benefit massively from taking glynac when you're younger than that but uh, certainly when you're you know 70s or 80s it will be something that I would take pretty much every day but I'm not going to swear by it <laughs> in this video because yeah it hasn't given me some sort of a transformational experience myself like I haven't noticed a massive difference by taking glycine and NAC like I have you know, noticed benefits from taking glycine alone but not NAC because my glutathione levels are already you know pretty optimized and I'm uh, healthy overall I don't have oxidative stress or inflammation so that's why I can't swear by it myself I can't swear by it based on the research <laughs> uh, but what supplement I can swear by personally for my own personal use is gonna be somewhat controversial or, or interesting it's gonna be I'll name like two of them, but number one is going to be HMB. So this uh, is a byproduct of leucine and the amino acid. And uh, what the HMB usually in studies has been shown in the elderly people again is that it helps with sarcopenia and muscle uh, loss. So it helps to reduce muscle breakdown and reduces uh, muscle loss in the elderly people. Now again, I'm not an older person. <laughs> I'm not experiencing any like sarcopenia or muscle loss, uh, but I do have noticed that pretty consistently over the course of two years, two to three years since I've been taking HMB on and off. Every time I take it, uh, I notice that uh, just I maintain slightly more lean muscle mass. I haven't done like a like a split test with it, like I measure my DEXA scan or something like that, that precisely, but uh, just based on my own subjective experience that every time I'm taking HMB, then I'm just a little bit stronger, a little bit more, let's say, muscular. Uh, when you look at the studies, then HMP doesn't work with muscle growth. So uh, it's not like an anabolic agent, but uh, at least in the elderly people, it does reduce muscle breakdown. So I think that what is happening in my experience is because that because I am doing very prolonged intermittent fasting every day. So I eat only like two protein meals a day, like one before working out, I'll have like a protein shake for some 30 or 40 grams protein. And then in the evening, I'll have a dinner. So because my eating window is somewhat narrow and I only spike protein synthesis twice a day, having that HMB in the morning in a fasted state reduces my muscle protein breakdown and it makes me less catabolic. So it, you know, I'm not sarcopenic by that definition and I'm, I don't know, I'm not skinny either. I have even plenty of muscle and uh, muscle tissue, even if I'm not taking HMB, but it's just that the, what I notice is that when I'm taking HMB, then I maintain it slightly more. Uh, obviously that's very subjective, but uh, based on my own experience and uh, it's not obviously that's why I said that based like I can swear by the clinical trials the glynac but based on my own experience I can swear by HMB that yes I noticed that it works at least when I'm taking it while fasted and at least when I'm doing this form of intermittent fasting that I'm doing right now if I were to eat three or four meals a day then probably this wouldn't work or I wouldn't notice any difference but uh, in my own example right now this apparently like works 
This episode is brought to you by Bond Charge, my favorite company for blue blocking glasses, red light therapy devices, and red light light bulbs. These items are essential for keeping your circadian rhythms aligned in a world that tries to mess them up. Instead of looking at your phone before bed and letting the blue light disrupt your melatonin production, why not wear blue blockers instead that prevent that from happening? Instead of having your bedroom lit up with bright lights, choose the more sleep-friendly alternative by opting for flicker-free red light light bulbs that don't disrupt your sleep. Bond Charge also has amazing infrared sauna blankets that can give you the same health benefits of the sauna. You also get the unique benefits of infrared light that improve joint and skin health. Head over to bondcharge.com forward slash seamlund and use the code seam, S-I-I-M, for a 15% discount. The other example is also berberine. Now, berberine is like a herb that helps with blood sugar regulation. It helps with lipids, cholesterol, and those kind of things. It's obviously not as powerful as metformin for someone who has diabetes. I don't have diabetes. There's no reason for me to take metformin, uh, but I do take berberine just for like improving blood sugar levels every once in a while, because I do think it's better to avoid these massive spikes in blood sugar levels. And sometimes if we were to be eating like a larger meal or just a meal that has a bit more carbohydrates, then uh, the berberine can help to blunt that response. And berberine also has some other interesting properties that uh, is also like this AMPK activator, which uh, is, co- is this pathway or a sensor that also activates autophagy. So I use it as a calorie restriction mimetic, first and foremost. I don't really you know, have any blood sugar swings either. My blood sugar levels are very normal when I'm using the CGM, the continuous glucose monitor. But uh, with the berberine, I'm using it as a calorie restriction mimetic to drive or to activate more of the fasting pathways that uh, would otherwise be activated only if you're doing like extended fasting or if you're in a severe calorie deficit. So I use berberine to pretty much magnify those effects in, as a, like a longevity tool or hack. Now, there's not a lot of like evidence about that strategy having any actual outcomes for longevity, uh, but I can swear by it because when I'm taking berberine, and uh, I've been trying that out for the last few months, when I'm taking berberine, then I notice that it's actually somewhat easier to lose weight. Like if I take like a larger dose of berberine, like one gram of berberine for dinner, and uh, I'm trying to lose weight, then uh, the weight loss is actually quite fast. Like or it's ve- it's it's very powerful for weight loss as well. At least per- based on my own personal experience and. Uh, Using the CGM, the continuous glucose monitor, I also just see that taking the berberine keeps the blood sugar very stable, even if I'm eating a very high carb meal, if that makes sense. So this, because the berberine isn't like an actual pharmaceutical, it's a herb that just has these um, anti-glycative and anti-blood sugar or anti-diabetic kind of effects that it lowers the blood sugar levels and obviously has benefits for the lipids as well. There was some recent study that berberine was helpful for atherosclerosis and reducing the plaque in the arteries. That's a, it's just one study as of now, and it has had some flaws as well in that study. But yeah, you're just berberine as a herb has pretty long track record of medicinal properties. And based on my own experience, it helps with blood sugar levels and weight loss as well without actually jeopardizing muscle growth or muscle mass, if that makes sense. So these are the kind of supplements that I personally swear by from my own personal experience, HMB and berberine. And from the clinical trials, then uh, Glynac appears to be, yeah, it really works. It appears to be one of those uh, supplements, at least in the elderly people. Next question is somewhat relevant. What's the best way to control glucose spike when eating carbs? So first of all, it's normal for your blood sugar levels to rise after eating like you know it pretty much happens to everyone unless you're eating literally like a zero carb diet or if you're uh, somehow taking large amounts of let's say fiber or large amounts of fat that will blunt the response but in most cases most people will see somewhat of a small rise in blood sugar levels that's perfectly normal what's the problem is that if the blood sugar level stays elevated for too long so the blood sugar rises after eating and it stays elevated for you know six eight seven eight hours that's uh what happens in diabetes your body isn't producing insulin to lower the blood sugar levels and that's why the blood sugar level stays elevated for a lot longer so normal people who produce insulin who aren't diabetic then uh, they will uh, be able to lower the blood sugar response but 
I, th I still think that it's you know somewhat healthier to not have like a massive spike <laughs> like if your blood sugar levels go above 160 180 milligrams per deciliter after eating then you probably just ate some sort of junk carbs or some simple sugars that spike the blood sugar that high if you're eating like a whole food carbs potatoes buckwheat rice quinoa even fruit then the blood sugar levels shouldn't really spike above 140 milligrams per deciliter so uh you know depends on the type of foods you're eating but let's say in this scenario you're eating junk carbs you're eating birthday cake it's christmas whatever you're eating some sort of uh, junk food carbs that spike your blood sugar very high you want to first minimize the the, uh, the the ceiling you don't want it to go that high and you also want to make sure that it doesn't stay elevated for that long so what do you do number one exercise if you exercise before eating any food you become super insulin sensitive because uh, these muscle contractions activate these uh, glucose disposal, let's say, transporters like GLUT4 that pretty much help to shuttle the glucose into the muscle cells a lot faster. And the, the GLUT4 works without insulin. So even if you're diabetic, uh, you're able to lower your blood sugar response significantly by exercising before eating. And if you're not diabetic, then the better it is because then you'll be able to shuttle the glucose into the muscle cells that much faster and much more efficiently as well and uh, there's the other part of it is also that if you deplete your muscle glycogen then there's going to be a massive sink for the carbohydrates to go and if your muscle glycogen is already full you're sedentary you haven't exercised then the the more likely it is that it's going to be overspilled or it can stay elevated for that long because the muscle glycogen is already full but if you exercise specifically resistance training so you deplete muscle glycogen then it's going to be like a sink like almost like a bottomless sink uh, you can store up to 400 grams of glucose as glycogen in muscle so you can pretty much yeah you know have like a massive um, advantage in terms of your glucose uh, disposal if you exercise before of course it's very hard to fully deplete your muscle glycogen it's almost impossible you would have to do like some sort of a marathon or something um, or uh, just have like a several hours of uh, weightlifting to deplete the muscle glycogen fully so it's very uh, difficult to achieve in the first place but even if you just deplete your muscle glycogen by 100 to 200 grams then uh, that's already like more than enough in a lot of ways Second of all, uh, if you also have lower liver glycogen, which does deplete with exercise, but if you eat low carb before eating the carbohydrates, then your liver glycogen stores are going to be somewhat lower, and that also provides like a smaller buffer. Liver glycogen is significantly smaller than muscle glycogen, so there's like 100 to 150 grams of glycogen in the liver, so uh, it's all easier to overspill, but it's again like another uh, ability to store the glucose more easily. Or not store but you know yeah store as glycogen not store as uh, fat or to overspill uh, when it comes to actual let's say meal strategies then of course eating protein and fiber before eating the carbohydrates also has has been shown to result in a lower blood sugar response or the postprandial glucose response after the meal so you eat fiber and uh, some proteins before you eat the actual carbohydrates. So start with the vegetables and protein sources and then move on with the carbohydrates. And you know that's why they kind of don't eat dessert first <laughs> because if you eat dessert uh, before the actual fibers and stuff like that, then you're gonna have a very large glucose spike. So if you ever you know, drink juice or a smoothie or something that has a lot of sugar on an empty stomach while fasted, then your blood sugar levels are gonna rise super high and uh, it's also going to come come crashing down <laughs> quite rapidly so you don't want to be taking in large amounts of sugar and carbohydrates especially simple carbohydrates uh, on an empty stomach you want to pretty much introduce the fiber and protein uh, first apple cider vinegar is another very common and easy let's say food additive that you can use to lower the blood sugar response and uh, especially when it comes to simple carbs it's been shown that the apple cider vinegar on top of the meal uh, pretty much lowers the blood sugar response up to like 40 to 50 percent so that's a very good uh, you know simple addition to any meal you can either yeah mix it in some water drink it like a shot or put it over the vegetables or salad whichever whichever you choose uh, i pre prefer to just use it as a salad dressing 
and olive oil in the salad dressing also has been shown to lower the blood sugar response because it's because of the fats and uh, it also helps to lower the lipid response the postprandial uh, lipidemia so that's like a very simple addition to any meal what you do after the meal is also quite relevant of course you can also take like berberine before the before the meal that's going to lower the blood sugar response you can take chromium you can take vanadium uh, cinnamon so there's many of these glucose disposal agents that can work berberine is probably the most effective one out of over-the-counter supplements and uh, chromium is the second best in my opinion because chromium it enhances insulin action so it it uh, pretty much enables more glucose to be shuttled into the shell in, into the cell uh, together with uh, insulin and what you do after the meal is uh, also quite important because if you sit on a couch and you do you do not you, you do nothing then uh, you're pretty much guaranteed to have this <laughs> like the slower elevation of the blood sugar after eating so what you want to do is just go for a short walk 10 to 15 minute walk that can it can pretty much bring your blood sugar levels back to normal within yeah a 15 minute walk so uh it, because it just helps to again shuttle the glucose into the cells but also lowers the blood sugar like you burn some of the blood sugar in the bloodstream for energy so it's another simple simple strategy that you can uh, use you don't want to do like heavy exercise because that you know can lead to some digestion issues but just the simple 15 minute walk after eating is uh, quite quite beneficial next question is it okay to put nac into hot coffee like lysine <laughs> that's an interesting question because if you've ever tasted NAC powder, then it's disgusting. It's very sour. It's not, you know, it's not sweet like lysine. It doesn't have any like taste uh, or like any good taste to it. So I don't know why you would want to put NAC powder into your coffee. Maybe you have some sort of other NAC, but all the NACs that I've tried, the powder ones, they taste like sour and uh, not really uh, good. Could you do it? Uh, yes, you technically could, but you know, I would be always very careful with consuming any supplement around coffee or with coffee because you know coffee tends to bind to minerals it can make you excrete some uh, minerals as well and some other nutrients so i don't i would i would not say that taking supplements with coffee is the most optimal way to absorb them because you're probably like excreting some of them due to the caffeine and the the, the coffee so i would be much safer to take the uh, supplements away from coffee you know you could still put glycine into the coffee because of the sweet taste and uh, if you're taking glycine multiple times a day then it doesn't really matter and uh, if you're taking sufficient amounts of glycine then you know it doesn't matter if you lose some of the glycine but at least the glycine tastes sweet whereas NAC is definitely not very uh, sweet it's actually very sour next question how did you increase your vo2 max i will do a separate video about this but if you uh, heard about it before then i did have year two max test like four to five months ago it got a result of 53 milliliters per kilogram per minute which is uh very good it's uh, in the highest uh let's say or the lowest risk for mortality category but uh now a few weeks ago i did uh another year two max test i got a result of 66 milliliters per kilogram per minute which is a massive improvement now the biggest reason for that is because i didn't do a lot that much cardio before the first test so i wasn't fully optimized my i didn't optimize my routine for cardio gains and vo2 max gains uh, at that point so my body was very sensitive to the new stimulus so whenever you are doing any kind of a new exercise or a new type of exercise the first few weeks are going to give you a lot of improvements and then and then the more advanced you get the slower the progress is so you know when you go to the gym for the first time in your life you're gonna see massive gains in the first few months but if you've been lifting for 10 years like i am right now and then the, then the improvements are gonna be like you know 0.5 percent per month or 0.5 percent per uh, year depends on your level of uh of your like prestige with the gym so you know it, the more advanced you are then the harder it is but because i didn't do that much cardio and vo2 max training before the first test then my body was just uh, okay this is new adaptation and we have a, like a, a lot of room for improvement if that makes sense the second reason how or the the second reason i did improve it that much was that i did a lot of cardio so <laughs> for the last 
three to four months i was doing you know pretty much three zone two cardio sessions per week 45 to 55 minutes each session and one hit cardio session per week so which involved or included uh, four minutes of high intensity like max out effort followed by four minutes of rest between zone one and zone two and then another uh, sprint repeated for four times so in total that was going to be like around 32 minute uh, workout with warm up and cool down included so uh, that's uh, the only like high intensity interval workout i did but i did once a week and the other times i did zone two three three times uh, per week so yeah that's the biggest <laughs> the most effective way to increase your vo2 max is to do more cardio all types of cardio whether that be zone two or the interval training as well and i do think that it's better to do either zone two or just the max out intervals because somewhere in the middle like zone three or zone four <clears throat> where you're running somewhat fast but you're not really max out sprinting and you're not really running that slow that you could breathe through the nose then you're somewhere in the middle and you're not really training the vo2 max specifically the reason you want to do zone two is because it lays the ground for ground uh groundwork or the basement foundation uh, to your cardiorespiratory fitness and your aerobic capacity so your slow twitch muscle fibers are trained with zone two and uh having a lot of zone two having a lot of a uh, slow twitch uh, muscle fibers pretty much builds a good foundation and uh, like a baseline to increase your vo2 max and then yes the interval training is the one that actually pushes the ceiling above for your vo2 max but if you don't have a good foundation if you have poor zone two then uh, yeah you know you need to do both pretty much and the more you do then the higher the vo2 max generally is gonna be uh you know if you do like hours and hours of cardio every week then there's no way your VO2 max isn't going to increase, if that makes sense. Next question, which country is your next retreat being hosted at? It's uh, still going to be the same India. I'm going to be uh, at the same clinic, uh, Iowa, in Chennai, India. And it's going to be a seven-day program. You get comprehensive overview of your health and your body. We do 180 biomarkers. You can do like a VO2 max test, DEXA scan to look at your bone density, muscle mass, body fat, uh, full body MRI if you want. We have ultrasound, echocardiogram, CT scan, whatever kind of tests, medical grade tests uh, that you want. Even like uh, facial skin analysis, hydrofacial treatments, you know, a lot of different kinds of spa therapies, massage therapies, dental work, eye health, like <laughs> pretty much you can do any kind of test that you want at the Ivo clinic and they have you know 130 medical professionals working there and it's a seven day retreat being held at uh, the uh, five star hotel Dalela Palace in Chennai so yeah that's the one I'm going to be doing in uh, next year and probably the years after that as well so I'm like a long term uh, partner with the clinic and you know it's very like uh it's very in terms of the price to benefit ratio it's massive like the things you get for the price are just you know it's it's like the best experience ever in terms of like a biohacking retreat like you know usually the regular retreats they don't offer anything like that they might have lectures they might have some workshops they might have some workout plans of stuff like that but uh you know this retreat is unique in the sense that you actually do all the tests and uh, you get the results and you get consultations from the doctors based on your results and uh, they can help you to put together your action plan supplementation foods workout plan etc and things like that so if you are interested yeah in joining me on my next retreat then uh, head over to iwo.com forward slash pages health vacation or you can also check the link in the description for more information about this all right next question best workout routine before i go into military service so this is something that i can just say from my own experience uh i went to the military when i was 18 and uh, before that i did train a lot because yeah i wanted to get fit for that and i wanted to like get the max scores in the uh, nato prepare physical preparedness uh, test as well um so um i didn't get the max points for that but i did get max points for push-ups and sit-ups and i missed i got like 90 90 points uh, so like 10 points short from the run two mile run uh so i did excellent i did it like very good for the test i didn't get the max points at that point but funny enough uh, last year there was the reserve uh, event so like i went back to the army for two weeks last year 
and uh, then I did get the max points. <laughs> so I have, you know, improved over the last 10 years since I was in the military. I have, you know, got the max points for the NATO physical preparedness test. But uh, regardless, what did I do? So the first time I went, I did a lot of calisthenics. You know, in the in the uh, military, you don't need to be bulky. You don't you don't actually want to be bulky. You don't want to be massive, uh, like a super massive uh, meat muscle. <laughs> you want to be somewhat of a leaner and be have a lot of endurance like endurance is a lot more important in the military rather than pure muscle strength you do want to be strong enough but you don't want to be maximizing your strength like the biggest power lifters and strong men they're not going to do that well in in the military training uh, so you want to be somewhat of a, like a you know either like a crossfit crossfit type of training or calisthenics so a lot of push-ups pull-ups sit-ups and running so a lot of running as well and uh, both extreme long endurance running as well as some sort of like a shorter you know five to seven kilometer run something like that so you want to do a lot of different types of endurance work plus a ton of uh, calisthenics and what i did when i was preparing for the first time of going to the military so in the morning uh, when i woke up i think yeah i i, I ate uh, like breakfast but like two hours after breakfast i did a calisthenics workout so i did pull-ups and push-ups pretty much to failure every time <laughs> because with calisthenics you can go to failure and recover from it quite fast it's not as intense as going to failure with like uh, weightlifting for example so i did go went to failure with push-ups and pull-ups then uh, i rested i had like uh, lunch and stuff like that in the afternoon i did some sit-ups also to failure pretty much for a few sets and then went for a run i did like a two mile run every day on some days i went for a bit longer five to ten kilometers but a, a two mile which is like 3.2 kilometers at minimum and uh, then on the next day i repeated it so pretty much the same workout every day like in the morning a lot of uh, push-ups and uh, pull-ups in the afternoon a run in the military what they do is that at least when you're in the barrack barracks they will do the morning gymnastics which is just you go outside with everyone and it, then you do like a workout with push-ups and uh, sit-ups and those kind of things some on some days you do the run but they kind of rotate between one day is calisthenics the other day is the run but you want to do again like both of them when you're out in actual field like in the forest and stuff like that when you're training then at that time you don't need to do a lot of like calisthenics is mostly going to be rocking so having like a weighted back that's going to weigh something something between 20 to 40 kilos so it can vary depending on the situation and how many stuff you have with you but it's going to be a pretty heavy uh, backpack and you need to like yeah learn how to carry that for you know some at some times it's going to be 30 to 40 kilometers and you have to just get used to carrying a super heavy bag for a long time you know pretty much the entire day so you know you know for training for that you could use like a weighted vest at home as well i recently got a weighted vest which is very nice 30 kilo weighted vest i went for walks with it it's actually very good if uh, you can't do actual cardio because it's like snowy or whatever the other reason it is or if you don't want to put too much pressure on the joints then the weighted vest can be very good for getting some cardiovascular benefits but also just uh, you know burning uh, extra calories because the, uh, the the vest is heavier than you would normally be, be walking with so if you're walking with a vest then you're going to burn more calories than compared to just uh, walking without any weights if that makes sense so yeah do a lot of calisthenics a lot of endurance and uh, like some sort of a weighted walking with either a vest or a heavy uh, backpack these are pretty much the only things you really need in the military in terms of like a fitness uh, side next question thoughts on olive oil well generally i think that olive oil is in my opinion the healthiest oil in the world it's been shown to have benefits for the heart benefits for the brain benefits for blood sugar inflammation uh, and uh, like blood pressure as well so it's yeah if you have good quality olive oil then it can be it can be one of the healthiest things that you ever consume so the problem is that uh, most commercial olive oils they tend to be mixed with canola oils or some other cheaper oils which isn't that uh, good for you 
or the uh, the olive oil itself could be rancid or oxidized because it's been sitting on the shelf for months upon end or it's been exposed to some sort of sunlight or oxygen or whatever else during transportation, for example. So if you have good quality olive oil, then uh, it can be one of the healthiest things for you. You know, to determine to determine like if it is good quality olive oil, then number one, you can check the bottle for okay, what are the ingredients? If it's if it's not mixed with any other oil, then that's good. If it is mixed, then it will probably say it. And yes, it's not going to be a good option. You you need to choose a one that has only the uh, olive oil. And extra virgin olive oil is generally better, and it has higher polyphenols and more stable or less likely to be oxidized. Dark bottle is also important. So the dark green or uh, black bottle is going to be just uh, preventing it from oxidation from sunlight and uh, just light in general. The, la the next thing is going to be the date of production. You want to getting you want to be getting the olive oil that is as fresh as possible. So, you know, anything that is older than six months is probably not going to be the most ideal option because it has due to the age of the oil, it has already gone rancid to a certain extent. So as fresh as possible and uh, not, you know, been sitting on the shelf for, for months upon end. You could also be like, if you want to really dig deep into, okay, is this oil good? You can check the brand, where they source their stuff from. They probably have a website and uh, quality tests on their website, for example. You can check those out as well. But the one actually very useful tip and a very safe alternative to olive oil is also just eating olives, regular olives. So the green olives, uh, you know, is the same fruit as in the oil. Uh, so obviously you're not getting as concentrated amount of the oil, but you're still getting some of the polyphenols and some of the other healthy fats uh, from the olives itself. The problem is that you probably have to eat like a lot of olives to get the same effect as from olive oil, but uh, as a safer alternative, uh, regular green olives are also a very good option. You don't really, or I wouldn't recommend eating the black olives or any other colored olives because their food dyes and uh, the black olives are just, uh, they have food coloring. So I wouldn't like recommend choosing those ones, but the regular green olives, uh, they're, they're pretty good. All right, that's it for this video. If you want to ask me a question in the future, then make sure you click the like and subscribe and follow me on Instagram at Seamlund, where I do those Q&As there regularly. Other than that, thanks for watching this video. My name is Seam, stay optimized, stay empowered.